Good afternoon, Robin. Hey, Mike. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm excited. Today's a little different than the last two episodes. Today is very different, and, and I'm also excited. Um, so for the benefit of our audience, let me introduce a gentleman that I've had the pleasure of knowing for a couple of years, um, John Rossman. Um, John recently released a book with his partner, Kevin McCaffrey, called Big Bet Leadership. And um, we asked John to join us today from a couple perspectives. One is talk a little bit about the book. And two is, in particular, when we think about change and the, the focus of the podcast, to think about the change involved in a big bet organizational decision versus just regular change or incremental change in the organization. So first of all, John, welcome. Robin and Mike, thanks for having me on the How to Change podcast. Thank you. So for the benefit of the audience, can you, there's a whole lot more to your background than just this book. I happen to know it, but I'd rather have you explain it to the audience than me explain it to the audience. Yeah, well, as Robin and I were talking about uh, in the Wayback Machine, I was a partner at Arthur Anderson, and then I was an early uh, Amazon executive. So I launched the Marketplace business in 2002, ran a couple of businesses there. I left Amazon in late 2005, was a partner at another consulting firm, and got to work through a variety of great organizations, including the Gates Foundation, wrote a book called The Amazon Way, wrote a book called Think Like Amazon, and then, as you mentioned, just released a book called Big Bet Leadership. But kind of what's constant through all of those is, you know, our job, my job, has never been maintain the status quo, right? It's always about... Uh, making change, hopefully positive change that's positive for the business, for customers, for employees, for stakeholders and, and shareholders. And so this particular book is, it, 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 we had several motivations and several storylines for it, but part of the motivation was um, being more prescriptive than I have in my other books about transformational change. So the subtitle of the book is Your Transformation Playbook for Winning in the Hyper-Digital Era. We wrote this book for senior executives to be an actual playbook, things they should do in order to actually make significant change happen. That's what a big bet is. A big bet has two core attributes. First, it has high ambition. A big bet has the potential for a major positive influence change, trajectory change for a business, but it also comes with multi-sided risks and complexities. That's the other thing. And so high ambition, high complexity, and, and high risk, we all know the vast majority of these fail. It starts with the recognition that the things we do for our normal kind of run the business initiatives or incremental change initiatives, those aren't only not enough for a big bet, they actually oftentimes do damage, do harm uh, relative to a big bet. So that's kind of why we wrote the book. My co-author, Kevin McCaffrey, Kevin ran a strategy and planning team at T-Mobile and ran new business incubation. I was an advisor to that team and to Kevin for almost three years. He then went to Google, ran a big uh, strategy team within the Google ads business. So this book has the benefit of many uh, companies and stories and things that we saw be successful in major transformations. We modeled the book after four leaders that we know, we've worked for, we've studied that haven't created transformational change once. They've actually done it several times. They have a system for it. And those four leaders are Jeff Bezos, John Ledger from T-Mobile, Satya Nadella of Microsoft, and Elon Musk. And so it's, it's told partially through the lens of what they do differently as what we call big bet legends. Like they've repeatedly done this. And we try to give a very practical framework and set of steps wrapped in a great story. We didn't try to burden it with too much to help a senior leader be successful at a at a hard but growing in importance aspect of their job, which none of us or few of us have actually been trained for, which is making actual transformational high ambition change real in a company. Awesome. Thank you. 
before we dive in a little bit about some of your experiences with change, uh, I'm going to I'm going to do a little quick I'll say commercial, but endorsement of the book. Um, I was fortunate enough to get an advanced copy because of my relationship with you, and and I've read it and and already posted my review on Amazon. Anybody in the audience that knows me uh, knows that I like simple. And so it's, 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 what's awesome about it to me is, you know, just to hear you talk about those organizations and those individuals that everybody knows by name, right? And yet the way that you and Kevin outlined it in the book, it was simple enough that really I feel like anybody with any business acumen can follow. And while obviously maybe the size of the bet is different based on the size of the organization, I feel like it's, it's kind of a... I don't want to call it a recipe necessarily, but a framework that truly any organization can follow if they commit to it. And I think that's one of the big things that I took out of the book is that so many organizations don't really commit to those big bets and how important that is. Um, so first of all, thank you, because it, it, it it's helped me a lot. And, and I do, I want to dive into that. And I don't really care where you want to start. But if I think about the big bets and, and what's in the book in the ones that have been successful and the ones that haven't been successful, obviously, as you said, there's a huge element of change when an organization is going through a big bet. And so if we can just kind of take an excerpt or a perspective from the book of uh, relative to change and talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, so I mentioned kind of four big bet legends. We believe they have three essential habits that are different than other really good operational leaders. They do these three things in order to create that systematic transformation. They create clarity, they maintain velocity, and they accelerate risk and value testing. So it, it all starts with that create clarity component relative to change. And the simpler the change, the, the it's more, much more line of sight. It's much easier for everybody involved to understand both the problem that we're solving uh, and what our our hopeful future state is that we're doing this. And it's much more of a, you know, I refer to it as kind of a line of sight um, initiative. That's most of our run the business, continuous improvement um, types of projects. But the more transformative it is, the more important and hard it is to create that clarity. The clarity that we want to create has a very good understanding of the problem that we are trying to solve. Most I, I've I've got an engagement going on right now where you go and you interview ten people about an initiative, and while they all sound the same relative to the problem, they, they all have very different framing on the problem. That's the simple part of this. Then there's the future state. What what's our hypothesis that we believe of? Like how is it really going to work um, in the future? And what most teams and leaders suffer from is vagueness and they'll they'll talk at a very abstract level about you know improving a cycle time or improving a customer experience or you know some financial metric but they actually do not have a theory of change about what that future is and how they're going to get that that's and, and then they don't have a complementary business case but not just a, a, a financial financial model of it, a, a risk oriented financial model that recognizes the baked in hypotheses, the guesses that are in our financial cases that have to be part of your experiment uh, log that you set forth and making sure that, you know, we always talk about the juice being worth the squeeze, like you are setting off on a major uh, commitment in every single way let's make sure it's we are focused on you know that the juice yeah. is worth the squeeze so without that fundamental problem understanding future state and financial case do um in involved you are doomed from the very start that's why maintain or create clarity is the very first of those big bet legend habits Awesome. Thank you. So first of all, my smiling while you were talking, Robin's so tired of hearing me and my partners talk about our clients and in having objective outcomes that are measurable and demonstrable because so many times, you know, to your point, organizations come in and like, well, what do you want to change? What do you, you know, what do you expect to get out of this investment? Um, and it's, it's, 
not clearly defined and it's not measurable. It's subjective. Um, and, or, or, and, or, and, and, and if it's not at a clarity level, then we can't have the fine grained debates about like, is it this or this? Or how would we yeah. test it? Like, cause, cause especially when there are major transformations, like these are not line of sight. These are over the horizon destinations we're going towards. And so you're, you're projecting, you're guessing at where you're going. Well, you can't do that. So, you know, one of my favorite words, Mike, is outcomes. So the very first chapter is called mm -hmm. thinking and outcomes. And it takes the Amazon working backwards a, a famous kind of approach of kind of writing in memos and debating the memos and everything. We we reverse engineered that to, for situations that are not Amazon that are specifically major transformations and for a company that frankly doesn't have the the DNA of how to do these memos like Amazon. So we became fairly prescriptive in how to do these memos in the book and i think it's a it's a killer habit in order to develop but it's it it's hard like it's a different I, way of of working and i, I want to peel that back underestimate that I, I apologize for interrupting you but i want to peel that no, back please. that was that was actually where i wanted to go second because um i stink at powerpoint i really do and i'll tell everybody that and and so yes. for me one of thanks robin one of the biggest things for me when i read the book was this concept of memos and it's not that i'm a great writer but the more i thought about it the more i thought wait this makes a lot of sense in terms of and i think some of it is just the effort that it takes to construct a well-drafted memo, which you talk about a lot in the book and, and helps a lot, certainly for me in, in my way of thinking. And secondarily, you know, talking about how to make meetings more productive um, and, and how much different having a memo approach versus a PowerPoint approach can be in that. And, and again, kind of bring that back to change, right? I think there's an organizational change element to literally how do we plan for and conduct our meetings that affects everybody, even if they're not doing a big bet right now, right? Every organization can learn and, and very few are really, really good at proper preparation and um, conduct of meetings. And so let's talk about the memos a little bit more if you don't mind, John. Yeah, so I'll quote Jeff Bezos on this. So he was recently on a Lex Friedman podcast and and they were talking about the memos and a couple of the things that Bezos observed so astutely uh, is that um, working in memos, writing in memos, it's, it's hard on the author, but it's much easier on the participants, on the reader of the memo versus PowerPoint is the exact opposite. It's easier on the writer and the presenter. It's harder on on the audience the other things that they suffer from is with a presentation that's going on you don't know what's coming up so oftentimes you have a question the meeting gets interrupted because of asking a question well that topic's actually going to be addressed three slides down when a meeting starts with a memo and people read the memo they get through the entirety of the memo they see if their question is addressed or not and then you can have a conversation about it the best meetings have a memo that's sent out a few days in advance so that people can actually you know sleep on it you get to read it you get to think about it you get to read it again you don't need this for every situation, but a, a big bet is a is a potentially big resource commitment. It, it's a it can be a very strategic decision. Those are the types of situations where it's better to 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 think about these things a little bit more, you know, and kind of go slow to go fast. You know, there's many metaphors, right? Measure twice, cut once. Like all all of those things are are correct, but that memo writing it's it's a skill it can be developed it it does take time and patience for it there's you know a lot of research and we the one appendix we have in the book is about the research about why memos matter and why it's a different way of working many popular books kind of talk about this you know focus work you know so cal newport's uh, deep work is a good example of that but it helps you escape from this interrupt-driven workplace that we all participate in and actually think about a situation and the medium of writing it out in fully constructed documents with paragraphs, with a reader in mind, with a specific intent for the meeting, 
helps everybody do their job better. Awesome. I'm, I'm going to take you off the hot seat for just a second and put Robin on it. Mm. Um, because I think, you know, going back to it's about time, <laughs> I, yeah, right. I've been in business for 35 years. Robin hasn't been quite as long as me, but you know, long enough. And, and, you know, on our previous podcast, right, we talked about how important leadership is in managing change and, and leading by example. And, and so Robin, I'm curious to get your, and you know, we, we didn't rehearse this, right? So I'm curious to get your raw reaction to listening to John talk about the memo putting the impetus on the leader or the presenter versus the audience from your perspective based on your background. So Mike and I know uh, about an assessment that we love and use and and it's a it measures natural tendencies. And one of the natural tendencies that you typically find in those more executive senior leaders is they are more about the bigger picture and they are more about charging ahead and then having, if, if, if they're smart, they have a, a team that supports them and, and gets into the weeds and the details. How do those more senior executive leaders feel about doing memos where that can be something that is time consuming, it might slow them down, they don't necessarily want to put all their thoughts out in that much detail. How, how, how does that work? that dynamic work. Yeah, so th there's a couple of scenarios there. Oftentimes it's it's a team that's preparing the memo for the senior team and so it's not the senior people who have to write the memo, but they do have to read it, digest it, but it gives them the opportunity to actually understand the critical thing that we're proposing to be done. Like that's, we call it the what sucks, right? Like what's mm -hmm. the real problem that we are solving? And what do, what's our hypothesis for how we, how specifically are we, we going to solve that question? Well, that gives the senior leader the opportunity to be more than just an administrator, right? It gives mm -hmm. them the opportunity to flex their experience and actually show like, oh, I know what the real problem and I have a hypothesis for what that is. And so in many cases, it, um, it allows them to actually influence what is being built. And so in the military, they call this the commander's intent. It gives the commander the ability to actually set what is the mission and how are we going about it while still enabling uh, teams in order to do the work. You know. You know, that's called highly aligned, loosely coupled working, right? Like that's what we want relative to this. And this gets exponentially more important when you are not making simple or line of sight change, but when you are making over the horizon change or big bets. The little play on words of the title is big uh, of big bets. The big isn't the size of the bet. The big is the size of the ambition. Our whole whole goal here is to de-risk these highly um, ambitious but multi-sided risk initiatives. We want to de-risk them well enough so that when we do actually commit big to them, uh, they're largely de-risked except for an execution uh, basis. So one of the chapters is called Think Big But Bet Small. And that's the real mentality here is, and these these memos are actual, actually experimentation. People don't appreciate like that you're actually experimenting far cheaper, far faster than you would if you write a vague notion. And then you you create this ad, agile team that's exploring its way through this journey. Well, oftentimes, you know, Mike, you, you and I, I think you've heard me refer to agile as the methodology of no accountability. It, it, it they, they be, and it's not their fault. It's the fact that constraints and specific from and to constructs, the big bet vector have not been con created that their, their agile process is supposed to figure this out. Well, there's much better paths to doing that than just setting off on a vague journey to nowhere. Yeah, at the end of the day, I think what I like about it is, you know, if if you've never run before and you want to run a marathon, if you decide you want to 
climb Mount Everest, right? There's a tremendous amount of preparation that goes into those things. And this is no different, really, except for it's amplified because it's not just me as a human being and what I want to do. It's taking the whole organization there. So I think, you know, to me, the preparation required, to your point, in making it clear and and removing the vagueness and, and getting everybody aligned is what many organizations just don't take the effort or make the effort to get to. Um, and, and I think for me, that was one of the biggest things coming out of the book was just, you know, how do you help people understand that there's no shortcut? Like you've got to put the work in and you've got to do it in order for it to be less risky. Um, th- th- there's no silver bullet. You're not prescribing a silver. And, and like I said, it's, it's not, you know, in reading the book, it's not, you know, this is going to solve all your problems. It's a framework for how to make it better, easier, and and um, more consistently successful, um, and that to me was the beauty of of you know what you and Kevin outlined in the book, and and so um, I want to be mindful of of the audience's time. I'll give Robin one one more chance because I'm no, I know Robin long enough to know she might have some more questions, so I'm going to give her <laughs> one more chance before I shut her down, and then I want to talk <laughs> to the audience about where they can get more information about you and the book and everything else. Go ahead, Rob. So, so here's the question that's just been kind of going through my, my mind over the last few minutes. So you have these four extraordinary leaders, and they've gone through these traditional changes time and time again. How much do they really consider the impact on the end user, which they are so far away from in a lot of a lot of instances, the the people that are on the front lines, the day to day, you know, team members, employees that are going to be experience this change. How much is that part of this their process in considering how this change should be managed and and the tr- and, and another piece of it is transparency. We know through change management, the 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 end uh, result. Everyone wants to know what's in it for me. And then they want to know as much as they can possibly know. And, and we know that as leaders, we can't share everything, but you need to be as transparent as pros- possible. So how do those two aspects play in at that senior executive level? Yeah, yeah well, uh, on, the, on the first, or, you know, I, I equate that to customer centricity. And what I think you'd be surprised by these four transformational leaders and good executives that, that I've worked with is how curious and how they want to actually know the customer experience. And so they do it in lots of ways of, you know, we talk about a Gemba walk uh, in the book, which is management by walking around, but walking around with a very specific in person uh, intent dog fooding, which means you you actually become a consumer of the own product. But everything about this is engineered to create clarity and clarity of decision and understanding about, you know, whether it's an internal user or an external user, what is the problem we are solving for them? And what's our theory, our hypothesis about the distinguishing factor, not all the things that are required, but the distinguishing factor that is going to get them to do the thing that is always the goal, which is adopt, right? Be Mm -hmm. willing to make a change. And you can't do that by, by just mediocre or average or our experiences, you do that by creating a killer feature or use case that really solves a high value problem for the user. So I believe that this is extremely well set up. The second thing about this entire process is it creates radically more transparency about both our thinking on what this is and where we're going, as well as recognizing that the the risk base and inherent nature of we don't know exactly how this is going to to work out. And so oftentimes this results in a portfolio of experiments that need to be conducted to essentially learn to de-risk this in various aspects before we make the big commitments. A big part of the book is dedicated to communication. Once we've done this fundamental work of creating the big bet vector, the problem, the future state, then we can adequately commun and and the nature of the experimentation we're going to do, then we can appropriately communicate the right 
uh, stakeholder the right messages in a repeated way. So we talk about the chief repeating officer in the book and writing destination postcards, focusing more on where we're going and why, depending upon the stakeholder, than a burning platform message about like what we're solving for or the journey that we're on. And so if those things are are calibrated correctly, the communication helps the shareholder, the stakeholder know what they should know. And it's consistent, right? And it's done in a story format. We know that stories are 22 times more memorable than facts and figures are. And so a lot of this is done through the storytelling narrative format. So I, I, I think it addresses those in a very compelling, clear, and differentiated manner than typical types of, of you know, kind of methodologies of rolling mm-hmm. out change. Great. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, John. Absolutely. Mike. Good. Well, hard I, I think, question. Hard I think question. Mike, because he let me get one in. So. <laughs> Two. I, you oh, got sorry. two. Yeah, I agree. Okay. That was two. That was a that was a double loaded question there. There so. we go. So, uh, John, first of all, again, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I know you're extremely busy, especially with the book coming out. Um, so we really appreciate you giving us some time. Um, where can the folks find more about the book? Where can they find the book? And where can they find out more about you and Kevin and, and what you guys are doing? Well, any bookstore uh, will have it, online bookstore. So, of course, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's a beautiful hardcover book. It's a Kindle book, great audio book uh, experience also. And you can find Kevin and I at BigBetLeadership.com or LinkedIn, John Rossman. Thank you, sir. Again, truly appreciate the time. Great to chat with you as always. I always learn and uh, look forward to seeing what's next. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. you. Thank you, John.